Hi, everyone. Um, hello, and welcome to the third episode of Manomed Small Sit Virtual Series called Coastal Dredging, Restoration Opportunities for Shorebirds and People by Manomet's own Mike Molnar, Director of the Coastal Zone Initiative. Um, I'm Gina Rourke, Manomet Senior Director of Marketing and Communications. I'm going to be your MC today. If you are new to Manomet, a little background on our organization. Uh, we use science and collaboration to reverse shorebird decline, promote coastal resiliency, and educate and inspire the next generation of conservationists across the Western Hemisphere. If you're a friend, volunteer, trustee, counselor, or donor to Manomet already, then thank you. It's only with your support that we can continue to get our boots muddy, and in some cases, sandy, doing hands-on science in collaboration with local partners. And uh, just a couple housekeeping notes for today's webinar. First, we'd love for attendees to type into the chat where you're all Zooming in from. And then after that, we're going to reserve the chat for any tech issues you might be having so we can resolve them on the back end. Um, also, we welcome your curiosity. So please type any questions you have into the Q&A box and Mike will be happy to answer them at the end of the presentation as time allows. And now I'm going to turn it over to Mike Molnar. The floor is yours, Mike. All right. Thank you very much. Let me go ahead and get this high quality presentation booted up here for your view and enjoyment. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mike Moeller, Director of the Coastal Zone Initiative here with Manomet. Pleased to be with you today. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about the work that my program focuses on. But first, uh, you're about to enter another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind, a journey into a wondrous land of imagination. And the next stop is the Coastal Zone. And so witness, if you will, a natural coastline where processes are in balance and free from human impacts, a place where longshore currents move sediments in a natural pattern, where erosion and accretion occur, dunes form and absorb storm impacts, and a broad array of habitats exist from intertidal shoals and mudflats to salt marsh, dunes, back bays, and swamps, and a mosaic that supports aquatic and terrestrial species alike. A place in time where winter brings ice cover along the coastal embayments, or at least it used to, both protecting the shores from winter storms and carving mud flats and depositing fine grained sediments to support future generations of plants and animals in the intertidal zone. A place where the healthy coast in balance has natural processes that adjust to water level changes where habitat can migrate upslope or downslope to adjust to changing water levels over geologic time periods and supports a full suite of invertebrates, plants, and more animals, especially shorebirds and colonial seabirds. A place where the natural habitat is vast, uninterrupted, and diverse. A place where a storm event washes out a sandbar, where birds roost, there's another down the coast that can accommodate all, in a place where shorebird populations are spread out and can rebound from perturbations naturally. However, we know that things unfortunately are not that way. And as we look at our coast, we live in a world where humans alter the landscape to meet commercial, industrial, and residential needs. Along our coasts, uh, over 40% of our population lives in coastal counties, which is comprises less than 10% of the US land area. We have major ports and harbors supporting trade of goods and landing sites for fishery fleets. And all we know is the people flock to these coasts for recreational activities, especially in the warmer months, a little bit warmer than today. <laughs> um, a place where coastal counties account for more than nine and a half trillion dollars in goods and services annually and employ over 58 million people. We live in a world where maritime transport requires open waterways. And as such, we have construction of canals, jetties, and breakwaters that disrupts the flow of sediment. We all know that at one time, Cape Cod was actually a peninsula. Now it's an island, thanks to the Cape Cod Canal. In accordance with every action has an equal and inverse reaction, disruptions to our coastal environments in one locations results in effects on another parts of the coast downstream. As in the past, 
uh, graphic that was shown, sediment naturally wants to flow along the coast, pushed by wave action. However, man-made structures impede that flow and cause sediment starvation or erosion downdrift, as shown in this uh, illustration. You can see the erosion on the backside of the jetty um, due to that sand starvation. And as we look at this aerial view of Town Neck in Sandwich, Massachusetts, the entrance jetties for the canal disrupts the flow of sediment down the coast. As you look to the north, Scusset Beach uh, has accumulated a lot of sand, is a much more robust coastal area. Uh, and as such, the uh, jetties themselves are impeding the flow downdrift and starving those other areas. In reaction to that starvation, the human uh, reaction is to try to construct our way out of things. And as such, you see there's a number of groins present along town neck to try to maintain the sediment in place. Uh, it heralds back to something I remember from my youth, the old tale, uh, old nursery rhyme about the lady that swallowed the fly and then the spider, mm -hmm. then a bird and a cat to try to restore order. We tend to do that along our coastal environment. Sea level rise is and will further complicate these issues along our coasts. Waves will break further upshore, marshes will drown, and storms will have more of a reach into the built environment. Forecast predicts upwards of a foot and a half of sea level rise by 2050 and uh, three and a half to six feet by 2100. Just for a point of reference, in Cape Cod Bay, we've already seen 11 inches of sea level rise since 1928. And these numbers may vary depending upon uh, what we're able to accomplish in combating uh, climate change globally. We know what happens when erosion water levels threaten the built environment. We tend to protect those, envir those investments, uh, factoring in the facts that we have money invested and that is something tangible we tend to lose sights of some of the more natural features and lose habitat for other species. In some places, we see a more natural solution to these encroaching waters. Again, at Town Neck Beach in Sandwich, um, the photo that you see is stacked sand-filled core tubes, um, which is meant to buffer the wave actions along the coast. Approaches such as these, though, work best in low wave energy environment. And this is uh, the scene of that same location um, just this winter after Nor'easter came through and um, disturbed the sand tubes. The, the houses are still sanding, so I guess that was a success in that standpoint. A uh, case study that's in the news, this one made international news. The BBC picked it up uh, earlier this month. The community in northern Massachusetts recently learns the power of water associated with nor'easters and rising sea levels. Uh, private individuals spent over half a million dollars to nourish the beach and dune system in front of their coastal dwellings, only to have a storm come through three days later and remove all the sand that was placed. Over 17,000 tons of sand was removed in the span of, of one storm. However, the dunes were sacrificed and did prevent damage to the community. It's no surprise given rising sea levels and intensified storm events that the number of large scale economic losses in the US are increasing. The graphic that you see on the screen comes from uh, the NOAA billion dollar disaster webpage. And it shows that uh, from the 10 year time period of 2012 to 2021, there were 142 separate billion dollar weather events in the US totaling over $1 trillion in damage. 2021 marked the seventh consecutive year in which 10 or more separate billion dollar events impacted the US. Hurricane Ida in 2021 was the fifth most expensive natural disaster in US history and totaling over $75 billion in impacts. As sea, level, sea levels increase and investments in our coastal areas continue, these potential damages will maintain an upward trajectory. In reaction to this risk, many areas along our coast are seeing insurers pull out and homeowners and businesses find it difficult to insure their properties. A sign that insurance companies are aware of the risk posed by a changing climate and acting in a financially prudent way for their businesses. But enough about the built environment. 
for a bit, I'd like to talk a little bit about something closer to home for Manomet science, and that would be on shorebirds. We know that shorebirds have a diverse set of habitat needs, and those can be viewed as the proverbial canary on the coal mine, or in this case, the beautiful group of birds along a coastline that are seeing population declines. Shorebird habitats need needs can be at odds with human use and development. They need intertidal areas to feed, including deltas and other shoal areas, supertidal areas for uh, roosting and nesting. However, use conflicts arise when humans recreate on the beaches and look to shoal areas as sources of sand to nourish beaches and protect their houses along the coast. So talking about dredging, it's an opportunity that exists uh, to help both our coastal habitats and potentially our built environment. Every year, the federal, state, local governments, and sometimes private industries undertake efforts to remove sediment from where they don't want it and deposit it somewhere else. Uh, large hydraulic copper dredges, like the one shown here in their kin, disturb and remove the sediments from the, the, the bottom of the coastal area and suck it up and redistribute it somewhere else. The Army Corps dredges over 200 million cubic yards of material every dredging cycle. And uh, for 1998 to 2021, that totaled over 1.4, about 1.4 billion cubic yards of sediments from along the Atlantic coast. Of that amount, only about two thirds were beneficially used. Or actually, I'm sorry, only two thirds were disposed, one third being beneficially used. Um, and we're working towards a, a goal of 70% of beneficial use of those dredge materials by 2030 uh, due to some enlightened viewpoints in the core and amongst partners themselves. But one item to consider when thinking about beneficial use is the environmental regulations in place. This isn't just about contaminated sediments, but about the types of materials that can be used. The graphics on the screen are from a report by Coastal States Organization and American Shore and Beach Preservation Association, the Army Corps. It's just uh, completed a few years ago. Uh, the graphic on the right shows the beneficial use policies at the state level. You'll see that there is a diverse array of uh, requirements, whether being required to beneficially use, encouraged, or none in place. In addition, states have policies with regards to the type of material, and we're talking about grain size that can be placed uh, in a beneficial manner. Uh, there's concerns that with too much fine grain materials that you may smother uh, shellfish beds. If there's too much dark materials, you may disrupt uh, sea turtle nesting. And so there's uh, considerations that must be taken into account when you do that. In addition, um, there's a wide array of locations that sediments can be beneficially used, and we're working to identify how to get that fine or mix or sand uh, addressed to suit the, the most number of habitats out there. Uh, beach sand is the universal donor. It can be used most anywhere along the coast. It's the fine and organics that are a little bit more of a challenge due to impacting uh, vegetation. So when we talk about beneficial use of dredge material, there's different concepts that we can look at, uh, whether it be island construction or reconstruction, salt marsh enhancement, dune enhancement, beach nourishment, or near shore placement. Um, there's a wide opportunity out there to, uh, to work on this environmental issue. A uh, case study that we're looking at is Crab Bank Seabird Sanctuary in Charleston Harbor. This was a win-win project. The Army Corps of Engineers was going to deepen the port of Charleston, and uh, environmental groups and states and federal partners alike came together to plan for a way to beneficially use dredge material. The original cost estimates were between three and a half and four million dollars to place the dredge materials into uh, an island. Uh, the total actual costs, once all the bids came in, was only about $366,000 above what the federal cost would be. Uh, they created a 32-acre island out of those materials that is now uh, nesting and roosting sites for black-billed uh, 
skimmers, gull bill turns, least turns, Wilson's plovers, and laughing gulls. In addition, uh, it's been found that construction of this has uh, created a benefit to the communities behind it by reducing uh, damage to properties estimated at over a million and a half dollars for a regular 10 year storm event. And that the economic uh, benefits of the area is in excess of $5 million a year due to ecotourism and other activities. When we place materials, there's different ways to do it. The easiest is hydraulic placement of those materials. Uh, here, it looks like a, just a big straw blowing out material into different uh, situations for beach floor dune elevation enhancements, marsh, ele marsh elevation platform increases, or thin layer placement um, along the coast. That's the most economic way to move that material. However, it has some limitations with regards to distance. We look to the coast for other things. Uh, there's beach nourishment activities, uh, dune building activities. Uh, the graphic that's on screen here is again from Town Neck Beach in Sandwich, where the Army Corps dredged between 70,000 and 100,000 cubic yards of material from the canal um, late last year and placed it and did some restoration activities in concert uh, with the community to protect uh, the back bay and the town itself. There's another project in the works right now that's going to place um, approximately 300,000 cubic yards in the same general location to help with the sand starf nature due to the, the canal jetties. We're also bringing other manomet based information into play with uh, our work. The graphic that you see on screen is important shorebird sites in the Americas uh, maintained by the wizard program. This is collected through eBird data from Citizen Science. Uh, and this demarks areas along the coast where shorebirds uh, stop off either in migration or they're nesting um, in helping to identify and put a spotlight on these important sites. So we're taking this information as we work with partners. And next, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of that work that we are doing. Um, Manomet, thanks to funding from uh, NIFWIF, as well as uh, Wildlife Conservation Society, is working with partners through workshops, um, collecting data on case studies in projects that have worked and trying to transmit that information so that people can learn from successes and also mistakes of others as they build their projects. Uh, the workshops that we had in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia this past December brought together uh, over 100 people. Um, from multiple different organizational types, federal, state, uh, government agencies, nonprofit organizations, uh, to look and bring that uh, communal brain power together and identify sites and locations that could benefit uh, with future restoration work. We used uh, a mapping tool that our awesome partners at the Army Corps of Engineers developed. Uh, there's a lot of information out there uh, when you start looking at GIS and uh, bringing together all these data layers into one tool was a remarkable accomplishment and something that really was a great benefit as we worked through these workshops. Uh, the information was broken out into multiple categories, as you see across the slide, um, and I'll talk about each one of those a little bit. Uh, but having all that information in one place as we had um, the experts in the room was was really great. And uh, this tool also allowed people to draw uh, their potential sites um, onto the map. And we have that information uh, captured as we move forward. So this slide shows ecosystem goods and services urgency. So this takes into account loss of those ecosystem goods and services such as habitat, uh, stormwater attenuation, storm buffer, et cetera. The next slide looks at community benefits. This is making sure that we're taking an equitable approach to this work. As uh, you saw, some of these projects can buffer storm risk. Uh, so making sure that it's not just the communities that uh, can afford to do these uh, efforts on their own, but um, some more at-risk communities that are um, underserved uh, and may not have the mechanisms in place to address these issues. So making sure that we're taking an equitable approach as we look at these projects is of great benefit to everybody. 
And previously, I talked about the distance component. When you're looking at hydraulic dredging, five miles is viewed as kind of the economic extent uh, to where you can pump material and, and place it beneficially. Uh, the blue area shown on the screen are buffers around uh, navigation channels and projects along the Atlantic coast. We have the Intercoastal Waterway that the Army Corps maintains, and then they also have um, the navigation harbors. So we're we're looking to see where the material exists so we can match make that with uh, potential restoration projects. And then this one is near and dear to, to us here, and this pulls in wildlife habitat. There's a variety of different data sources out there, whether it be critical habitat or endangered species, uh, just species risk um, and abundance factors from NatureServe, our own information that I showed you for important shorebird uh, sites from the wizard and then also our wizard uh, areas as well. And just making sure that we're taking into account the wildlife uh, components in addition to all the other factors and it's got an equal weight as we go through um, and then this graphic that you see on the screen here is a composite of all of the sites that were flagged uh, through the workshop uh, and the the nice thing about this as we went through we were able to work with participants to uh, talk through the different scoring components each one of the categories, the resilience urgency, the EGS urgency, the benefits, community benefit, et cetera, uh, could be assigned a low, medium, or high ranking based upon uh, expert uh, inputs. And we had a scoring rubric that we were following along with this as well. And uh, we're also able to capture um, all of the collective thought about the importance of these sites um, whether, you know, there's black skimmers there, there's piping plovers, or it's a stopover for red knots or wimbrels uh, through the, the migration season. We came up with a list of 138 potential uh, restoration uh, opportunity areas along the North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia coast. We're working with our partners at the Army Corps and Coastal States Organization and within the three uh, focus states to prioritize this list down. Uh, 138 is a tremendous uh, identification of need and opportunity along these coasts, but making sure that we set priorities so that we've got a manageable and meaningful list for when future funding opportunities come up and arise, uh, we can point to this work and say, well, this group identified um, St. Mary's Island or the, the Os Osaba Island area as a, an opportunity for restoration. And then we can work co collectively um, to develop proposals. So with regards to the next steps with this, um, our work is to finalize those priorities. As I said, our goal is to get that done by early summer. Uh, we are going to continue building out a community of practice, pulling together practitioners from across uh, a wide array of interest groups and skill sets so that people are learning from each other uh, on techniques and ways to uh, implement these types of projects and uh, with the case studies that we're pulling together with that as well. And then uh, the identified need for engineering design work on these projects. As a former state coastal program practitioner, I can say that um, there was a lot of focus keeping the lights on and addressing all of the fires that were burning on a daily basis and not necessarily uh, with a long view uh, to doing the proactive planning and identifying these sites so that when funding opportunities do come along, everybody's uh, scrambling within the 30-day 30, 30 period until the deadline. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're building opportunities for success amongst our partnerships. And so obtaining additional funding to do some engineering design support and uh, technical support capacity building for partners so that we can have projects that we can just pull off the shelf. We know that are ready to go. We know who the partners are already uh, when those funding opportunities exist. And uh, with the end goal of doing meaningful restoration work that benefits uh, all the habitat along the coast. We know that a lot of it's at risk and without action, um, 
there's going to be some tremendous changes in ecosystem dynamics. We want to make sure that uh, we are doing our part to try to stem that tide and then also making sure that we address some of those uh, built environment considerations, given that we're all in this together. So with that, it's just the highlights of some of our work and all the background information that goes along with it. So hopefully you've learned something along the way and we're back to the real world and no longer in the twilight zone or the coastal zone, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that people would have. Mike, I do. I have a question in the um, Q and A box. It's from okay. Jody, and she says, "Interesting not to see wizard sites along the Delaware coast. What might be the reason? Is this a lack of state collaboration? I don't know if you have insight into that." Um, the sites that I posted up were potential important shorebird sites. I believe there's actually a wizard site um, dedicated along Delaware Bay. I'll, I would have to go back to my maps um, and get back to her on that but um, those dots were just uh, information collected from eBird um, and doesn't necessarily represent what actual actions have taken place there are a number of wizard sites important areas that have been dedicated along the coast in uh, both North and South America and um, I believe that Delaware Bay is actually one of those already Okay, great. Um, let's see, Wendy. Oh, Wendy says, can you shor share the shorebird network map link? I can find that and put that in the chat. Sure. Um, I did have a question. When if if material is getting redistributed and say it makes um, uh, a kind of an island off the coast, mm -hmm. what happens with vegetation? Does it get planted or it grows naturally, or how does that work? Does it anything how does that work yes that's the short answer is yes no but uh, it depends upon what the restoration plan is for the different site so as we look at these different locations um, there will be a plan developed to see what the long-term uh, purpose would be naturally you will get some recruitments of plants to sites there might be some seeds within the sediments that are dredged in the seed bank you know as they get exposed to a drier environment, they may germinate on their own. Um, some of those may be uh, species that you would want in a location, and some of them may be things that you don't, like Phragmites or other uh, invasive nuisance type species. Um, when we're looking at these types of island recreations, the purpose is to have, <clears throat> excuse me, roosting and feeding areas for birds, uh, primarily with the, the storm buffer. So having vegetation may not be something that is wanted in the design of those sites. I know that a lot of the partners um, do go through and do some herbicide treatments or some burning controlled burns to remove vegetation. In addition to reducing the amount of area that uh, birds can use for feeding or roosting, it's also an attractive nuisance. It gives um, some predator species an area that they can perch. So you, you'll get oh. peregrine falcons that will perch on signposts or on uh, trees during their migration and picking off shorebirds. Uh, great horned owls are another avian predator um, that will use that type of area. And that's been something that they've seen in Crab Bank down in Charleston that's a working to rectify. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I have another question um, from Nancy. In terms of offshore nearshore disposal, mm -hmm. does ACOE or Manomet consider this be beneficial use and can be important for coastal geomorphology, maybe Mor morphology, resilience, <laughs> and form formulation of nearshore bars that reduce storm damage. Yeah, so um, typically when, when the core or partners are hauling material offshore, it's to a deeper water site. So it's a site that has been cleared through all the different federal agency partners. Um, they're, they're identified as disposal areas, so they're deeper water. And once it's hauled out there and placed, it's, it's lost to the coastal system. Um, placing in the nearshore environment is actually a beneficial use. Um, here in Massachusetts, we see that uh, quite a bit, where they're, um, and by the nearshore, we're talking about um, water depths that are, um, you know, shallow enough that the the currents can push the sediment and it's not just stationary. 
Um, so by putting in the near shore, it can be pushed up onto the beach. It's put back into the system where it can form bars or shoals. Um, but yeah, so that that is an option with with the the placements. Disposal terminology means that it it tends to be lost. Placements is is more beneficial. Got it. Um, okay, oh, I've got a bunch of questions here. How does it work getting beneficial use of dredge material to create bird islands? Does it start politically? What's the catalyst? What will make it happen? And how is its siting decided? It a lot of it comes down to money. Um, one thing that I did not talk about just for sake of time, but I can adjust here, is the way that the Army Corps works is their budget is pretty siloed. They receive funds to do dredging projects through navigation, operations, and management funding. And um, their ability to use sediment beneficially is kind of limited by policies that are put in place, something called the federal standard that sets the maximum cost for projects um, that is economically feasible and environmentally friendly. And um, if a project is proposed to beneficially dredge material, use dredge material that exceeds that cost parameter, um, somebody else has to pick up the tab. Typically, offshore disposal tends to meet the federal standards, it's the low cost. Like with the, the Crab Bank example in Charleston, the difference between the offshore disposal and placement and creation of the island was $366,000. NIFWIF funds uh, were obtained via grants. There was a fundraising campaign all the partners came together and developed uh, the the proposal and the process working with Army Corps to do that. One of the things that tends to be a bit of a challenge is the way that Congress operates with continuing resolutions and not setting full year budget bills for organizations means that the Corps sometimes has a very compressed process when they're doing a dredging project. So they won't receive funds until you know, let's see, what is it, March? If <laughs> their, their budget is, is still kind of in a state of flux. It was supposed to start in October. So they can't do that planning and outreach with partners. So having uh, an effort in place where you identify areas like we're doing and doing some of the, the early legwork really makes uh, projects a little bit more feasible and, and doable. How about, um, what is the lifespan of an island created with dredge spoil, soil? Do you, does it last a long time? Do they last a long time? It depends. <laughs> so it depends on where you're placing it. Um, if you're in an embayment so in a sheltered area where there's not a lot of wave energy and fetch, um, it can last, you know, a really long time uh, with boat wakes being the primary cause of erosion uh, in those types of settings. Um, if it's in an open water environment, something that's more exposed to a longer wave fetch or uh, storm environment, it, it can be a little more ephemeral. It also depends too on if you're just using the sediments in, that's dredged at, to form your islands like Crab Bank or um, some projects down in Georgia with the Altamaha River uh, where they just place the material in a pile. Um, it's not going to last as long as if you do say put some some uh, stone protection or on the, the side that's facing the wave energy. Um, it's all, it all boils down to design. So it could be a matter of, you know, a few months, um, uh, upwards to, you know, decades. Thank you. Um, how about, let's see from Walter offset of creating habitat for birds is loss of shellfish habitat. How yeah. to rate the positive versus negative on that. Yeah, that's something that we take into account um, with our planning processes. One of the habitat layers that we had in there were shellfish beds. Um, and that's also a factor that a lot of the federal agencies like NOAA looks at through the Marine Fisheries Service. Um, they're looking at um, conversion of um, uh, critical or essential fish habitat. And you know, there's a lot of discussion that goes along with that. If there's known populations of shellfish, obviously that's not going to be an opportunity area mm -hmm. um, or it shouldn't be. Uh, we want to look for a place where we're getting the most ecological lift um, out of a project. 
Okay. Um, how, let's see, Beth asks, how does one get connected with resources to strengthen communities of practice? I am down the street from Manomet and very interested in how the beach erosion is affecting our community. Yeah, so there's a lot of information out there um, for homeowners. Massachusetts actually has a wealth of information on their website. Um, mm -hmm. And I can I can forward some links. I actually pulled that together for someone else that was just down the street from Manomet a few years ago. Um, they have a Smart Coast program and, and some other things in place that provide toolkits. Um, for the community of practice that we're doing, we're, we're working with practitioners um, who are in the space. Uh, so we're talking biologists, engineers, regulatory staff, to make sure that they're really well-versed in all the different tools that are out there. Okay. Um, Brian Harrington asks, is the ACE involved in regulating offshore banks so important to fish and birds, e.g. banks off the Massachusetts and the Mid-Atlantic, so important to waterfall fowl and fisheries? I don't know Sorry. what ACE is. Is the ACE involved? A-C-E. Okay. Yet another acronym that I don't know. Yeah, not, I don't know. Not, I'm not uh, sure what that is, Brian. Oh, Army Corps of Engineers. Oh, okay. Army Corps of Engineers. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the Army Corps is is involved in a lot of things. Um, I mean, they're responsible for maintaining all of the, the ports and waterways uh, in federal waters along the, the U.S. coast in general. Um, they do have planning efforts in place in Massachusetts for their different um, responsibility areas. So um, I'm not... Not sure what was the rest of the question. Uh, let's see. Is so important to fish and birds? Yeah, I, I guess what their involvement is, how deeply they are involved. It, it depends on the district. Um, New England district is taking um, a stronger approach towards uh, mm -hmm. thoughtfully planning for projects and identifying areas. Um, they actually just released a tool um, to help people better plan for beneficial use of dredge material in the New England area. Um, and there are some designated sites along the Cape where they're doing work and they, they know that they'll have a regular cycle. So there's opportunities there. It's heartening to know as a Massachusetts resident. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Jeff says, what is the approximate maximum distance that dredge material can be transported from where it is sucked up to where it can be used? It depends if we're, <laughs> we're talking a hydraulic uh, movement, which it's just if you've been on, on the beach in the winter months and you see these big plastic pipes that are just stacked up on the beach, those tend to be hydraulic dredge pipes. Mm. Um, the maximum distance just from uh, the ship to placement is a mile, but then you can start adding in booster pumps um, to increase that distance upwards of five miles is what we're using. Uh, for economically feasible. You can also have um, hopper dredges where they bring the material into the boat and um, they motor along and then the hull, hull itself actually opens up and drops the material in place. That would be more for near shore as opposed to an onshore. And the distance with that is, you know, whatever. Um, that's what they tend to use when they do the offshore disposal. And so those sites can be, you know, 10, 20, miles offshore. Hey, thanks, Mike. Um, let's see, Wenley asks, have you seen projects where the finer sediments are segregated for intertidal habitat and coarser material used for creation for bird nesting habitat? Yeah, so with the material composition, it gets into some of the, the state regulatory components. Um, and uh, the states typically, and I had a graphic up there, um, it's a 90-10 rule. So um, 10 percent of fines typically can be placed in a location. Again, uh, there's water quality issues with turbidity and then also potential uh, shellfish smothering or habitat smothering. But um, I'm not aware of the ability to segregate materials when it's being pumped. You know, it, it's a giant straw. So mm -hmm. um, if you place it in a pot of sediment that is, you know, 80% sand, 20% fines, there's no way to pull off the 20% uh, 
and put it over here and put the 80% somewhere else. It's just whatever you've got is what you've got mm -hmm. at the end. Um, there is um, some natural separation when the material is placed. Um, the finer grain materials are going to be, are going to remain in sediment uh, or in solution a little bit longer than the, the heavier stuff. And those tend to wash out a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it all comes to back to what your sediment cores say that you have and just planning for the project that way. Okay. Um, let's see. Wendy says, was the map Mike showed, the mapper that you showed that we use for site selection specific to South Carolina, or is it available in other areas too? So we developed in we being the Army Corps awesome GIS analyst, Trevor Lancaster, um, developed a tool for North Carolina, one for South Carolina, and one for Georgia. We have spoken with partners um, in some of our other project areas about developing a similar tool. Um, it has not yet been stood up. Um, it's all based upon needs. So if there's some place else that you're interested in, drop me a line and we can chat. Okay. Um, what level of need rationale data is required to at least get the conversation started for future use of dredge for habitat creation? The the main thing that I would look at is where are these projects occurring? Where are the dredge projects? Because that's the ultimate driver. Unless there's a dredging project occurring nearby, um, you're not going to get the sediment. Um, there's a caveat to that. There's a new requirement that every Army Corps district develop what's called a five-year dredge material management plan. And that is for future uh, dredging projects, but it also can uh, pull materials from upland sites. They're called dredge material management areas. Um, I said that some of the material can be placed offshore, some of it can be placed onshore. Um, so there's an opportunity potentially to remove material from those upland sites. But again, there's going to be a cost associated to that. It's not going to be um, something that the Army Corps is doing for free. So uh, working with a consortium, developing a project proposal to really hash out some of those things is, is mm -hmm. going to be your first step. Okay. With that answer, you answered the next question. And then, um, oh, did you just answer this? What, when decisions about funding, et cetera, delay, to, delay a project, can dredge materials be stored on shore for future use? They they can be. Um, it, it depends on if there's a designated dredge material management area uh, mm -hmm. for the placement. Um, there, yeah, it, it gets, gets tricky. Um, and I, I'm not an expert in Army Corps. I only play one on TV. And, <laughs> Um, but there might be opportunities to do so. I, I think the general answer is, is no. Okay. Um, we have one last question. Oh no, a couple. Um, Brian, uh, Brian Harrington was asking, he said, the question is about sand mining. Mm. Um, that was from the, about the army Corps of engineer and regulating offshore banks. Does that make. Yeah. So. Um, sand mining, we we see that with um, some beach nourishment projects uh, where, especially down south, uh, Florida, um, Carolinas occasionally, where there will be a, a shoaled area in like a, a delta tidal creek or river outlet. Um, and they want to remove the sand from there to put in front of some developed houses to extent to the beach. Um, there are permit processes in place mm -hmm. for that, um, but it, it's not, and, and this is me taking off my management hat potentially, um, there's not as, as strong of a regulatory look at those types of things as there is mm -hmm. um, in the, the creation of some of the sites for habitat. Got it. Um, all right, we have one more question and then we'll wrap it up. Um, do bird species have to be in danger in order for the um, Army Corps to consider creating an island? Again, it goes back to um, 
having a, a group that's developing a plan. So it's the Army Corps themselves are not going to go out and develop a plan to create an island. Ultimately, it comes up to the states and uh, nonprofit partners and local partners to to come up with an idea. Uh, the Charleston Crab Bank project that was um, Audubon and the states and, and a number of other partners working together over a period of 20 years to come up with that idea. Um, there are opportunities working with state partners to um, come up with, with some thoughts. We've done that working with partners in Georgia. There's a couple of um, island recreations that are occurring down there um, in the Cumberland River and the Altamaha River. Um, but it, it takes it takes a plan and it takes process. And um, that's one of the reasons why we're here. All it right, is. thank you. Thanks, Mike. That was a great presentation. And to our attendees, thank you for being here. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Manomat, please visit our website, manomat.org, or join the conversation on our Facebook or Instagram pages. And if you enjoyed today, we'd love you to support our work directly with a donation online if you haven't yet already. Uh, next webinar uh, next month is going to be about our herring work in advance of the herring festival in April. And if you're itching to get out and bird, we have a couple of events coming up. Um, we have a first Friday bird walk on April 5th at Manomet HQ in Plymouth. And also, if you're looking to do something with the kids, we have a fun drop on drop in crafting day on April 4th to help prepare for that herring festival. Check out our events page for more details. Um, thank you so much for the interesting discourse and all the great questions. And Mike, thanks again. We at the Small Sit are signing off. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.